Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the session. Okay, Colin, the stage is all yours now. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'll tell you a little story that happened just now. Um, if anybody's got cats, they'll know what I'm talking about. Um, went into the downstairs um, trait room and um, there's a small mouse there. <laughs> and that kind of delayed my progress towards this meeting. Um, I had to um, package, it, package the little fella up and get him out of the house, poor little fella. So, yeah, so that, that made me a little bit late and a bit nervous, but um, we're going to see some uh, good stuff today, something I've been working on for a couple of years with uh, NatWest. So, this session is entitled Using Splunk to Proactively Manage Mainframe Security and Provide Real Time Insights for Mainframe IT Operation Analytics. That's quite a long um, title, really. I have to make most of the pictures smaller to get the title in. So um, I hope it was worth it. Um, uh, it sounds quite a lot, um, but the whole principle, I think, of what we're doing is, is, is incredibly simple. Um, and hopefully that will come out over the next uh, few minutes. So I'm Colin Knight and work for NetWest. And I've been working there for 26 years, man and boy. Um, all the time in the DB2 team, and I'm now the DB2 Sysbog Tech Lead. So, all fun and games, as they say. Um, so, welcome aboard. Um, I'll crack on straight away. I uh, hope I'm coming across loud and clear. Um, my um, video is unavailable owing to the fact that my laptop died at 5.30, halfway through the Apollo moon mission at GSC yesterday. So I was really enjoying that. My boss rang and I took a call and I went back to my laptop and it was totally dead. Absolutely not a single light, nothing. And it's still dead upstairs in the recovery room. So uh, I'll take the hard disk out to see if I can find another laptop for that. But So from the backup laptop, um, we found a dead mouse and um, the day can't get much better. So moving on. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today. So first part, I'm going to talk about what's blank. And really that's more about what Splunk means to me in what I do and what I get out of it and why I'm using it. Um, then there's a session from Ian Hartley on Precisely. He's going to go through the, uh, what Ironstream does in connecting up Splunk and the mainframe. Um, the third part is going to be an unexpected journey into Splunk, kind of how it landed within NatWest and what we're doing with it right now. We'll have a Q&A session after that and I'll stagger away uh, a frightened wreck and grab a latte at the end of it, hopefully. So that's, that's what we're doing today. Um, hopefully nobody's left after I've given you the agenda. We can push on. Right. So, so why? What, what is it that, that maybe get me interested in Splunk? So, what what's, what really kicked it off was something called a Splunkathon, um, and this was really within it was, <laughs> it was within RBS then. Uh, obviously, we're, we're now in that west, but it, it was at RBS at that point. Um, and we were looking at um, so it's a two day sort of session um, where the idea was. Um, it's like a hackathon using Splunk, um, and the idea was that over two days, intensively, people sort of join teams from different areas of technology and actually look at problems and how they solve them um, and kind of bring Splunk to the table. Uh, so you've got real business problems, you've got Splunk on the other side, you've got people from Splunk helping, and you've got people from Splunk in RBS showing you what it can do, and we were sitting around writing. Uh, kind of code to make things happen. And myself and a colleague in the DB2 team were looking at this and thinking, wow, this is easy to use. Uh, we've got DB2 data, SMF data, we could load into it and it could really buzz for us. It could really show us, bring the data to life, bring the metrics to life. So that really is what got me started in thinking about Splunk within the bank. And before that, <laughs> rewinding slightly, in December, I went on the Splunk for Rookies course, and that was just a bit of an intro uh, 
um, it's about two or three hours in the evening down at Squunk uh, office, um, which was sort of put up as a preempt to the Spunkathon. So I went down there and that's when I really got to grips with sort of a bit of coding, a bit of filtering, a bit of understanding how Spunk works and how to get results and write dashboards and eat pizza, which uh, was all very good. And so that, that kind of got me interested in it. I think we could use it. I think we could do something with it. So the next thing was kind of working out how, what business case would work, what, what was it that we could really use it for. And during 2017, um, we were looking at um, ingesting that main pain data into Spunk. So we would take, um, I think we tried to take some syslog data and some SMF and ingest it into Spunk. And the success we had was limited because it's all very well having this sort of raw data, but when you just kind of ingest it to Spunk, it doesn't make sense on the other side. Uh, and some of the data from the mainframe is such that it doesn't lend itself to obvious reporting in Spunk. So we realized something needed to be sort of transformed, you need some sort of transform to make it understandable. Um, and that's kind of where we thought, well, are there any tools out there that, that do that, that connect on, sorry, connect um, the mainframe data into Splunk and trans transform it into Splunk data? And this is where we got to hear about IronStream, uh, the IBM product, which is CDPZ. So uh, by about June the next year, 2018, we had decided um, we wanted to give it a go. So we created a proof of concept, we trialled the two products, and, um, and off we went, learning about how they work, what they could get out, what, what it looked like in Splunk. And then in December 2018, uh, six sort of guys came along and we had certainly starting to see a, a real business case for our security department. And they had a project where most of the data in their project was sitting in Splunk. The bit missing was the mainframe data. And that's kind of where the streaming of real-time data from mainframe to Splunk was going to fill their gap. So SyncSort demoed IronStream and that's kind of where we got to by the end of 2018. So just, just rewinding a bit, what is Splunk then? What, what does it do to us? So um, the description there is from the Splunk website. Um, it makes it simple to collect, analyze, and act upon untapped value of big data. Um, that's a decent description. In my mind, um, from what I've done early on, and probably even now, it's a brilliant way just to visualize data, visualize patterns in the data, see volume metrics, graph it all out. And all of that with just a few simple sort of filtering statements. And it's, it is really intuitive once you start to use it and you can easily write dashboards and it brings that data to life in a way that um, it's quite surprising when you start getting into that. Right, so moving onwards back to the story at NatWest. So we began this proof of concept in 2018 and we had the two products to compare, one from IBM, one from Syncsort. Uh, we gave them both a fair trial and we decided by early 2019 that it was complete. We've now um, compared the two and Einstein was the one that came out on top. We had a project, as I said, security project needed something to uh, build a picture in Splunk of our um, security processes, and that needed data from mainframe. So we have business case, we have the money and the funding. And just about the end of June, I think as I was on the sponsored walk, we finally closed the deal and purchased Ironstream so that was all good. Um, then we all sat back and during 2019 got installed 
rest site for Ginger West 2019 got installed, found a few issues, fixed those, and started building towards production. Um, the key things we wanted to get out of it really were uh, in the start, DB2 and the RACF side. So DB2, because that's kind of what I'm interested in, and RACF, because we have the project paying for it, which was a security information project. So we had SMF 80s, SMF 100s, and syslog messages for, for those two items. We plugged it in to use the IEFU 83 exit, and that worked really easily. Um, and when you fire up on screen, you kind of get dynamically added those app exits, hooks, and off it goes very easily. Um, so yeah, we had a few rejections on SMF 8 in the longer run, and we fixed those as well. And um, so we kind of got to the uh, end of 2018, all ready for production early the next year. In early last year, in fact, we were looking at going live. So I'll leave my story there. And this is where I introduce um, somebody else who's going to present what Arnstein does, and that's Ian Hartley from Precisely, who are used to be sync sort and now Precisely. And I'm still trying to work out what that orange bar is and how to get rid of it. <laughs> it's bugged me ever since I created this file, I couldn't work it out. Every time I move it out of the way, it kind of redesigns the foil, so I've had to leave it in there. Um, okay, I'll um, see if I can find Ian. Hopefully I can unmute Ian and I'll flip over to, um, to his slides if I can. Not working. I'm trying to unmute Ian, but I can't at the moment. No, that's not work. Let's see if I can do it another way. Hmm. I'm struggling. Um, is it possible to unmute Ian? Anna, can you unmute Ian for me? Yeah, let me do it in a second. It just gives me time behind the scenes. Keep across to another session. It's all totally seamless. I think you should be able to hear me now. Yep, and here come your folds. You know, we can't, shut, you. Okay, you know, we can't yeah. shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> we can shut you up because we, I couldn't find you. Uh, yeah, you have the power. <laughs> okay, yeah. right. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Colin said, I'm Ian Hartley. I've kind of been parachuted into this at the last minute. So this is, as you can tell, coming together at a fast rate of knots. Um, I work for Precisely and we provide the Ironstream solution if you haven't really worked that out already. And we've had a, a long relationship with RBS over the years with many different things. Um, but obviously current focus is the Ironstream product. So I'm just gonna give you an, uh, an overview of Ironstream and how it fits into the, the bigger puzzle of things, okay? Um, so let's look at why Splunk even exists in the first place. Um, Splunk really comes to its, you know, market in the way that there's just data everywhere these days. And a lot of it is either structured or unstructured. It's very difficult to actually kind of wrangle this stuff, um, especially when data volumes are increasing at an exponential rate you know, all the time. So even though we've got data, we have to be able to get our arms around, with, around it and work with it and make sense of it. Um, so it really is true that if you have things like a fridge or a car, you know, there's telemetry data in your car, it knows what speed you were going when you slammed into the wall, you know, your insurance company may actually use that if they're assessing your claim. It really can be 
very useful, but you can contrast that with some of it that is not that useful. You know, do you really know to need to know that your fridge knows you're getting low on orange juice or something? Well, maybe, but the point here is that there's a ton of data out there and some of it you know, is really quite useful if you know how to get your hands on it. Go forward, Colin, please. So if you can actually get your hands on that information, you can then start making sense of it and making use of that information in the right way. But the, there are definite challenges around that, no matter what platform it is, whether it's your fridge, your car, or a mainframe, there are some things that are easy to do and some things that are more challenging to actually get over. Next slide, Colin. And Gartner really pinpointed this a couple of years ago where they came up with this term called dark data. And the kind of the distilled version of that is it's data that actually can be really useful, but it's hidden away. It's not necessarily so accessible or approachable and maybe in bizarre formats and not necessarily even legible. You know, you have to do some processing to actually make sense of it. But the key point is that there's value in that data, whether that's something you can actually use to say in their description, you can monetize that. And you know, we have customers that are actually doing that. Or you can actually tap into it because there are useful elements of information that you may not even a have known they were there, but b definitely not even using. But you know you're kind of missing a trick by missing out on getting into that information, and that's why they coined that phrase "dark data." And Splunk has really leveraged that, um, opening up lots of different kind of hardware and software elements across the spectrum of everything they cover. Next slide. So of course one of the main things here is that we're focused on computers, large ones, um, and they obviously produce a ton of this kind of log and machine data, which is Splunk's sweet spot around collecting this and hoovering up that kind of uh, goodness into you know, the mechanics of the Splunk environment. Next one, Colin. So here's just a Splunk sample screen. It's the standard search screen that um, you will see if you walk up to Splunk and you can download it for free and try it. Um, and it has a simple search mechanism. They're actually producing a new version of that at the moment. It's a bit more SQL-like, which obviously will suit more uh, some people more than others. Um, but it has a processing language in there that is quite straightforward and actually is very powerful to actually get the information you want. And the data just lives in indexes within um, the infrastructure. You decide where that data goes. You can put it all in one index. You can split it by type into different indexes. But that's kind of the, the basic mechanics that you search for data in an index. And you, one of the key things is that each of those records are called events because it's something that happened at a point in time. It's an event, whatever that may be, obviously dictated by the actual content of the data. But the point here is that you can look at that information across a period of time. Colin and I were chatting yesterday about one of the issues they're looking at at the moment. Um, and you know, with the power of Splunk here, that you can actually use that to say, well, how, how does this compare with an hour ago, yesterday, last week, last month, or whenever? And also Splunk allows you to do lots of other things with data generally, you can leverage the historical data for many different things. You can look at trends and look at you know, which way things are going up or down. But you can also factor in more modern processing around things like machine learning. And we're doing that within some of our tooling to actually do things like forward predictions. So let's leverage the history of what we've seen before as training data and put that into a kind of static, you know, standard data scientist environment to leverage that to go forward and say, well, where are we going in the next hour, the next two hours, or even you know, beyond that? So that's kind of you know, a 10,000 foot view of Splunk. And of course, beyond and above that, just the data, not necessarily too exciting, but you can get like, really nice modern UI and dashboards out of that as well. Next slide, Colin. But what do we do when it comes to the IBM platform? So, particularly mainframe, but also the IBM I, or AS400. 
Um, now, fortunately, some these are some of the most metered boxes on the planet by design, and they have been for many, many years. And that's a good thing. The not so good thing is they would typically put together these logs and these kind of these outputs, some of it for user consumption, job logs, for example, but some of it was really put together by IBM for their own purposes, of course, um, in that they were looking at uh, diagnostics and the deep dive kind of nuts and bolts situation when something really did, did go wrong, a piece of hardware generating something that they need to be aware of, um, or even for things like their billing purposes, you know, trying to tap into their calculations, always a challenge potentially. Um, so, you know, they, they kind of have produced this for their own needs. Of course, you know, they didn't really project that people would want to be really leveraging this kind of information. But here, there's, you've got to remember, there's a, a vast array of different types of information. We all know, I would assume, SMF, RMF, et cetera. You know, RMF, there's a gazillion different metric data points in there you can look at for whatever reason from hardware and software. And of course, there's an, a whole array of SMF we can leverage as well. As Colin has said, you know, SMF 80 from RACF has a good you know, set of information in there you can actually make use of. But then we also have customers that are leveraging real-time access into USS logs, for example, because you know, we've seen a shift in the market around how people are actually using technologies on the Z platform. Um, so, you know, things like Z Linux are coming very much to the fore. Next slide, Colin. But when it comes to these platforms, there are often challenges, even right from the outset. The base, they're based on EBCDIC, not ASCII. And Splunk does not understand EBCDIC. Why would it? Splunk has a big market as it stands. It's got very much, you know, the cloud and the servers as we expect them to be covering. They're, they're, all those bases are covered, plus the hardware around it as well, network switches and things like that. But they cannot tap into these IBM platforms. And so that's, they actually came to us um, at the tail end of 2014 and said, when we were SyncSort, we're now precisely, um, and said, you know, can you help us guys? We're coming across these large organizations that have these machines, we don't understand them, can you help? So that's when our product, Einstream, was conceived and put out to market very quickly. So that really does allow these platforms to kind of join the, the data party, if you like, and get into things like Splunk. Next slide, Colin. So we're just going to now cover what Ironstream is from a very high um, level and just look at what we can actually get out of it when we bring these things together. And this is some of the journey that Colin is going on. Next slide. So 10,000 foot view of the architecture around Ironstream. Fundamentally, you know, the precisely Ironstream kind of engine you install on the LPARs that you want to capture the information from. And that applies both to mainframe and IBMI. So you could put it on just your production LPARs or it's really up to you where you want to deploy it. And then they're configured to collect the information that you want to tap into. And in Colin's case, I don't know, Colin is a selection of syslog and SMF80, et cetera, really kind of bringing that into um, the Splunk environment. But we allow you to not only collect the different types of information, but we allow you to filter that as well. There are, you know, we're very aware that these machines can generate a lot of data in a very small amount of time. So you can get down to the field level and even allow you to select which ones um, to forward based on some simple logic to say only take it when X equals Y type thing. And it's very effective, simple but effective. Um, and you can see the array of information across the bottom. One of the most popular areas is SMF, of course, because there's a huge different variety of information in there from SMF 119s for TCP IP traffic to SMF 230, the standard for ACF2, for example. There's a whole you know, array of things that you can configure to get from this product. But we're just not limited to that. RMF, as I mentioned, we have a very simple check mechanism to go and turn metrics on or off around that. We can get log4j information in real time. And we've even got an API. If you want to kind of step outside that box, you can use 
some code if you want to write that to actually sprinkle information into Splunk on a schedule that suits your environment and just get in the fields that you want. We have customers that are tapping into things like DB2, for example, just to get exactly the information they want across in the time that they need them. There's many different ways you can use that. Um, but the key thing here is that it's, it's on the schedule that either by the API that you want or it's pretty much in real time. And that really is a game changer, especially when you put it into the context of things like security, because it's not something has happened, it's something is happening or is just started. And that really then feeds up into things like the tools at the top here on the top left, where we have Splunk Enterprise Security. You don't necessarily have to run these things, but you know you can because we do interface with them, both Splunk Enterprise Security and IT Service Intelligence, um, to actually get the information into these SIEM tools and these kind of business um, analysis tools of what's going on within your system. So you can actually see in something like Enterprise Security side by side the mainframe and the non-mainframe kind of activities going on side by side and you can correlate that information together. So that's kind of the 10,000 foot level. Next slide. When we look at the use cases, they really do fall into these four kind of areas. Um, we see customers, as Colin has already said, you know, looking at security, but you know, we've had discussions around operational intelligence and monitoring, et cetera. And I think we've even touched on things like PCI DSS for credit card compliance as well. So we've kind of covered all the bases. And it, we see this over and over again with customers. We start with conversation in one corner and it quickly spreads to the other corners. Next slide, Colin. But it really comes down to two major topics. It's the IT operations, the analytics of what's going on, you know, day to day, blow by blow, but also it's the security side. And they're both big topics in themselves of which you can start small and you know, kind of expand from that point. And we say that over and over again, we start with a very kind of tight use case, but we see that it just grows over time as people tap into the wealth of information that's there. Next slide, Colin. As I mentioned earlier, Simple searching, but actually you can get quite a powerful UI. So these are some of the sample dashboards that we have that we, we give away for free. Um, and you know we tap into various different things here. You can see there, there's a ZOS, or ZOS workload analysis, for example, um, that actually leverages some um, machine learning. Uh, we have a, a batch monitor down on the left-hand side there at the bottom in the colors, given a kind of traffic light indicator for timings around SLAs, for example, has that batch breached a batch job breached SLA. And there's various other things. You can have real time dials. We can see the speed dials there top left showing kicks regions with you know the average response time. Are we kind of in the right zone here for this time of day and things like that. It's coming in real time. So you know it's really quite insightful, especially when you put that with information that is meaningful side by side that is actually maybe challenging to put together in any other way. That's one of the benefits of using something like Splunk. Next slide. Now to make it easier, because we do appreciate that, you know, maybe some people are deep soaked in mainframe and your Splunk people are probably not deep soaked in mainframe. And so we're kind of attacking things from both ends. The fact that, you know, people understand Splunk, but your mainframe may not even know what Splunk is and vice versa. Your Splunk person, typically we know, yeah, you work for a so-and-so organization, but you don't know that the, even the mainframe even exists in that organization. We come across that all the time. So there's, there's a knowledge gap there. So to address that, what we, we've done is we put together a, a something, some mechanics within Splunk, leveraging their own mechanics, which is um, a data model. And what does that mean? Well, like it, it's kind of like it as a DB2 view. It's the same data underneath. Maybe that's SMF flavored, for example, but the, the data model sits over the top as a transparent view that you can look through it's an intelligent lens, if you like, that translates it into more user-friendly field names. So it's not SMF30, JBN or JNM or whatever it is. I can't even remember the name. Um, it is the job name from a batch job. It's actually shown as batch job name. Most folks can understand that. So with a little bit of information, you can actually get to understand the data a bit easier. You don't have to think about well, where's the data coming from, which type do I need to use and which fields do I need to look at. That's just kind of in a hierarchy in the data model. 
And then literally within 10 clicks, you using the tooling without even looking at a search or thinking about how you build your search, you can actually generate charts within the Splunk environment and share them out to the wider team. It really is you know, quite remarkable when you put things together like that, that you can get something you know, together in a very short space of time. Next slide, Colin. I mentioned earlier things like Splunk IT Service Intelligence. For those that don't know, um, it's kind of a, a business summary of mechanics around all the pieces that make up business systems, if you like. Um, this is a, a, a Splunk licensed product on top of the standard um, Splunk customers, uh, Splunk software. And we do have customers that are making good use of this. For example, we have a US um, automotive company that are using it for their orders for vehicles, et cetera. You know, they wanna make sure that's a very slick process and it's all happening. And so they kind of rolling up metrics and thresholds into this. And that's what it operates around. You know, are we seeing a response time within the, the guidelines that we've laid down that is good? And that colorizes these boxes that are kind of the top of the tree, if you like, around the, um, the infrastructure that underneath. So typical kind of uh, mainframe flavored base system or where mainframe plays a key part is things like mobile banking. A lot of moving parts in that, a lot of infrastructure, but you can really roll it up into one or more boxes on a screen like this to say, it's all green, everything's good. We know, you know everything is working. If it changes color, something somewhere is having a, an issue based on the thresholds that we said, you know, if it falls outside these, that's you know, something we need to, to look at. And of course, if it goes red, something is a bit more dramatic than, you know, but it allows you to go layer by layer down into the information that you're being, bringing in. So we interface with this as well. Next slide, Colin. And as for enterprise security, we also bring around to bring in uh, RACF, ACF2 and top secret information. We've done the plumbing work to getting into this, this interface. Again, another chargeable product from Splunk. But that said, this is all SMF data. You can get that into standard Splunk. You don't necessarily need to have the enterprise security solution on top of this. Um, that, that is what brings everything together and also the, the tooling around it. But you can still look at the information. It's still there on disk. It's still in these, these indexes. So you can still leverage that information. As Colin made reference, you know, they're using at NatWest, they're using SMF 80 and RACF. So they can still look at that information and get valuable insights from that with or without enterprise security. Enterprise security is kind of the icing on the cake, if you like. Next slide, Colin. And again, we have a ton of different dashboards that are available um, out of the box. I'm not gonna go through looking at these, but you know, there's just so much information you can look at. You can spend days going through information around different data points and how you could use it. But there's just again many different use cases you can put this information to and really do that kind of bringing together things in many different creative ways. Next slide, Colin. And to help you get going within the context of Ironstream and Splunk, we've actually put together a bunch of what we call starter packs. And so we have things, for example, a collection of out of the box, again, these are free to new adopters. Um, best practice that we've seen other customers using, things that they want to see, typical questions that you, you as a new customer would ask. You know, we know you're probably gonna ask about this because you're interested in DB2. So we have um, out of the box charts and searches, et cetera, that you can use and just pick up and start running. And we've had a new customer recently that did exactly that. They picked up the IT operations dash, uh, starter pack and they quickly changed it because you can change it they quickly changed it to put it into the context of five critical systems. And those systems would simply a drop down on the, the black dashboard there, and they could bring in Kix regions, DB2 in subsystems, et cetera, into one screen where they could quickly flip between systems, a bit like the IT service intelligence uh, screen to a point, and get the context of actually what's happening now because it's real time. So again, it's really quite powerful. Next slide, Colin. And just to kind of finish off my section here, um, you really can get creative. Uh, I spoke at the Splunk conference recently with a guy from uh, FIS Global, 
down in Australia. They're a good customer of ours. Um, they very much operate in the credit card space. Well, certainly the guy I was speaking with, um, Chris Livy, he's focused on credit cards and they've made some really dramatic changes and they, they just love Ironstream. They think they're getting you know, great value from it. So they've literally gone from the classic 30 to 70 you know, screen. It's got three, three colors on, I think. Um, gave them all the information they wanted, but it was a limited audience. You had to have mainframe access. You didn't necessarily have to form a line to actually get access to that information, but it was on the screen. They have to present it potentially to actually update it. It gave them the information, but it just wasn't in the right place at the right time when they needed it. They had to go and start the transaction to actually look at it, etc. Now, what they're doing is bringing that information with Ironstream across into Splunk, but they're supplementing it. So he's also doing things like bringing application data into the mix from DB2 and putting some more context in there. And they literally have transformed their view of how things are interpreted in real time in that now they have, and this is the graphic he gave me, um, they have an iPad, iPad view of the same kind of data, but it just is shown in so many different ways. They have it down to geographical um, pinpointing as much as they can. So much so it's given them more agility in the business because they can now say we're having issues and this is in the US here on that map, but in a, in a certain place. And they can literally disable certain parts of their infrastructure, whereas before they had to do it at a much higher level and with a lot, a lot more impact. But now it's given them more focus around what's actually happening and even down to the terminal level of actually where people are swiping their cards or using chip and pin, for example. So you know, it's, a, it's a great use case and they're just you know, reaping the benefits from that. So again, limited by your own imagination. Really. So Colin, I think that's back to you now. Hello, thanks for that Ian, that was great. Um, and now I feel a bit guilty because my, um, my files around what I've done this month aren't anything like as glossy as those. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a contrast, but it show you just what you can do with very little training in Splunk and uh, very little imagination in my part. So, right, let's flip back to the story. So, if you remember, um, recapping fast, you got to this point. So, back to the story of getting Splunk and the mainframe connected up within that west. So it was an unexpected journey. What was a DB2 expert doing? Well, okay, that's, that, maybe that was over it. What's a DB2 person doing with um, Splunk? So um, yeah, it wasn't expected from my part, for sure. So quickly whizzing through this, that's where uh, you missed go. So I just want to give you a brief background as to what's going on in NetWest, the sort of key stats sort of size of mainframe and everything. A um, little bit around security, the first project, and the real reason why we've got on stream within that was testing and proving, and the journey really into production. And then just a few screens that I've actually been using literally just today and, and this week to really see what's going on in a couple of mainframe problems that we're looking at. And then hopefully we get some time for questions and answers. And hopefully my cat's asleep and he's not bought any more mice. So um, I'm just trying to find out where he is at the moment, but uh, I think we're safe for the time being because the mice are probably bedded down somewhere safe with a bit of luck. Okay, moving on. Right, so got five production mainframes, uh, 700 million plus kits, DB2 transactions on a peak day, and up to 20,000 plus transactions per second peak periods. So big mainframe and the mainframe is the system record for the bank and from the mainframe we've got ATMs hanging off it, we've got mobile banking, point of sale, corporate banking, telephony and all the major brands that make up NetWest. So crucial to operations and um, yeah big data store 
effectively. So back to the story, if you remember, before Ian's session, we had a project that wanted Armstream to plug a gap in their Splunk visibility of security events, and Armstream was chosen as the gap filler. So we um, bought Armstream, got it installed. Uh, we then started looking at other user cases um, around kicks. We know what you can do with BB2, NQ, we're looking at it possibly for sort of monitoring angle, capacity planning, showing some interest, and security actually had other business cases now that we're looking at what they could do with uh, Splunk and mainframe data from Armstream. So, um, went through 2019, as I say, um, installing, testing, fixing, testing, and it was all looking good. Uh, back end of 2019, we were thinking, oh, we're going to have to go live early 2020, and wrap it up, and off we go. Unfortunately, I think we all know what happened in Q1 2020, and for very good reasons, we were not able to install our nice shiny new product in the mainframe because we were under lockdown. So we stepped away, continued doing testing, but stepped away from the production side, parked it for a little while until all was safe um, and ready to go and restrictions were lifted. And really what we were doing is using, what we planning to do was use Splunk to build a picture of what security events are happening in the mainframe. And the SMF 80s give, give our security guys everything they need from the mainframe. So we run, um, or we're running, syslog forwarder and SMF forwarder uh, as a pair of started tasks on each old car. And alongside the um, SMF forwarder, we also have another task to do something called DLP, which is data loss prevention. And this is a feature that kind of uh, starts a chat between the mainframe forwarder and the Splunk itself. It requires a Splunk heavy forwarder and Splunk end and heck. But the idea is that um, uh, you send data to Splunk by TCP IP and Splunk says, yeah, I've got that. And therefore on the mainframe end, they can, we can delete the message from in this case, we use the coupling facility. So we can delete the message in the coupling facility and the message has therefore been sure to get into Splunk. So that was a good feature and it fitted in with the security profile, making sure that we got all the data, any event that happened on the mainframe, we could capture it in Splunk. So we did a bit of volume testing and I added a load of uh, kits, SMF records to push up the volume of uh, data going through to see how the CPU went and that all looked good and um, we did have one issue performance around Splunk end and mainframe ends that didn't seem to be running fast enough so we transferred the tasks into STC high. Okay so now we deployed it in production we had to have a few changes for firewalls which um, is a challenge, as it should be, uh, but that got done. And we were ready, finally ready, to deploy in two weekends in October. So on the first weekend, we deployed the quiet LPARs. Second weekend, we switched on the rest. So there's seven, I think, LPARs on the first weekend and eight on the second. And after the second weekend, it was all up and running. Looking forward, we'd really like to connect it up to EasyDB2 because that's another product from uh, precisely in sync sort. And I think they would really go well together. Just creating some really good dashboards for DB2 activity and going out showcasing um, what mainframe data and Splunk looks like. Because I think it's a, it's a wealth of information we get from it. Okay, now we get to my um, slightly, well, significantly less glossy charts that I've managed to create. So this is basically just showing you an overview so I know that the Splunk uh, connections are all working and the Armstrong sending the data. 
So here we go, we've got on our test environment, QPAX as we call it, we've got six L files. And there at this interval, we can see we've got this number of records for syslog messages for DB2 and security. Uh, at that time interval, I think it was running at 15 minute intervals. So the last 15 minutes, 760 messages out of the QF and 257 out of QB. And the rest look as though they're pretty much quiet. On the SMF80s, you've got loads of messages out of QA, QB, and less from the other four L cars. And with DB2, because SMF8, SMF100 records are being cut regularly by HDB2, you kind of got a fixed number you're expecting in any particular interval. But you can see from that, you've got more DB2s on QC to QF, and QA and QB, but less DB2s, but they're all coming through. So that's a good screen just to make sure our testing is working. Now we're seeing uh, all the data coming through for Splunk in the last 15 minutes. Now we get on to, as you can see, what I was doing Tuesday morning between midnight and 3 a.m. I was watching problem. And this is just showing you a chart of the deadlock events for a particular application during that time period for this application. So I could filter it. Uh, I think it was by plan and by transaction. And I could see and count very easily as those transactions deadlocked. I just press my button and it is effectively a monitor to show those deadlocks. And we've been using that for a little while now. So it really does easy to show when they're happening and how many you've got. And I think this is another one where we are looking at a problem with um, resource unavailable. And so if you can see everything's running fine. Oh, just after 11, we've got uh, partitions to fall and we start getting these messages coming out. And you can see at the top, we've got 128 in this interval. And that's when they started up there and that's where they are up to now. So again, all I've done, we've got the index name, we've got syslog type, the DB2 is a DPA type. That's the message I'm looking at. I want to see that message string in there and I want to see that message string. So any of those reason codes for that object. And I've got all of that, just like that. Even a dinosaur like me can actually code Splunk really, really quickly. Right, and that's about it really. Thanks for listening. And um, I'd like to move on to any questions. So. Can we unmute anybody for any questions, Anna? Yep, sure. Now to charts. No, <clears throat> no questions, Colin. Just a really good, uh, really good presentation. That was very, very interesting. Um, I'm quite interested in the use of uh, monitoring performance data and system data. Have you always? Are there any other? There is a question actually. <coughs> are there any other uh, uses of? Splunk in the bank to monetize uh, customer data and to actually point it at um, actual transaction data. Yeah, so I think um, I think possibly as per usual, mainframes are kind of a bit late on the scene. <clears throat> We've certainly got Splunk in use for a number of monitoring uh, aspects. So I think we monitor our um, kind of mobile banking operations. And if anything goes slow or has an issue or flags an error and logs on, on the servers and so on, that will get picked up straight away by Splunk and that alerts and, and you get sort of a recovery and an incident raised and call out to the uh, support staff. And I think corporate banking has also 
a similar sort of dashboard and monitoring capability than Splunk. So it is really, it is an operational kind of monitoring tool we're using it for already. Um, so yeah, it's, um, we're kind of quite late to the show, unfortunately. All right, well, Colin, thank you, Colin and Ian, thank you so much for your session and thank you to the participants for attending this session. Please submit your session feedback. Don't forget about it. And thanks so much for listening. Um, if you appreciated our contributions, then uh, please contribute to our charity for this year, which is the NHS Charities Together. And even if you hated it, please do support this really, uh, a really good charity. Um, all money going to uh, NHS friends and colleagues. And um, that's it. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Have a great day. Cheers.